من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اما بعد فان اصحاب حديث كتاب الله واحسن الحديث حديث محمد واشار الامور مرتاتها وكل مرتات بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار Uh, brothers and sisters, um, of course, uh, I wish to apologize, of course, for the, uh, somewhat of the, the delay uh, this, for this uh, particular topic on the uh, Nation of Islam and its offshoots. I just wanted to say, of course, that this is a um, very uh, emotional topic for some people. And, of course, many of the uh, issues, of course, that it deals with are, of course, uh, historical They deal with uh, a legacy which actually has, has gone back to the mid, in this country anyway, to the mid-1930s, but which uh, the actual roots of it, or the roots of this type of thinking and this type of movement, uh, go back even further, all the way back to the time of uh, the very early years of uh, Islam. I was uh, on, in a hadith by... Hudayfa رضي الله عنه he was once uh, he once stated in Sahih Muslim it's recorded in Sahih Muslim he stated once that uh, it was the habit of the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said to always ask him to always ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said about the good he said but I he said used to ask him he said about the evil he said for fear of falling into it and In other words, we find that from this particular hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu anh that the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to always ask him, of course, about the ways and the paths that would lead them to Jannah, that would lead them to the path of Tawheed, that would lead them to the mercy and bounties which Allah ta'ala would, of course, uh, bestow upon his servants. But he said it was his habit, he said to ask him, he said about the evil, he said for fear of falling into it. In other words, he used to ask him about all of the things that were astray, all of the things that could lead a person astray, all of the things which were shirk, all of the things which were bidah, all of the things which were haram, that could ultimately lead a person into the, the hellfire. And the reason that he said he did this, he said was for fear of falling into it. In fact, There is a uh, line of Arabic poetry which uh, touches upon the same concept where uh, it states أَرَفْتُ الشَّرْ لَا لِلشَّرْ لَكِنْ لَتَوَكِّيهِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَرَفَ خَيْرٍ مِنَ الشَّرْ يَقْوَ فِيهِ That I didn't learn evil just for the sake of learning evil but I learned it for protection. And he who does not know the difference between good and evil will fall into it. So, uh, with that particular introduction, I just wanted to state that, as I said at the beginning, that this is a, a topic which has its origins, which goes back to the uh, very origins, practically, of Islam itself. We find that during the time of the Prophet wasallam, that there were those who uh, opposed his prophethood, either for reasons of uh, nationalism, for pride, or for a variety of other reasons. And one of them, who you may have heard about, was in, uh, called, uh, became known as Musaylimah al-Kadab, or Musaylimah the liar. And he was called this name because of the fact that he claimed prophethood during the time of the Prophet wasallam. And it wasn't because of the fact that yani, uh, he was denying the fact that Muhammad wasallam was the messenger of Allah, It was because of the fact that he too wished to share within that and thought that this was something yani, that could be uh, bestowed upon any person just by virtue of the fact that uh, yani, he should strive for it. And down through the years, we find that there have been a number of people who have tried to uh, put forth the same type of call of prophethood, of claiming either they, that they themselves were prophets or that they were recipients of revelation or that they had some sort of uh, share with uh, receiving some sort of uh, spiritual guidance from Allah and so forth. 
And in fact, the um, Prophet وسلم, stated in an authentic narration in Sahih Bukhari that the hour would not be established until 30 liars came forth, all claiming that they were the messenger of Allah. And we found, of course, that down through the years of Muslim history, that there have been a number of people who have put forth this type of call. And they haven't all, of course, come at the same time. They've come in various lands at various times, etc. Some of them, of course, if we look historically, if we look, for example, in India, we find that the uh, Indians had this man by the name of uh, Ghulam Ahmed, who was really supported at that time by the British government in order to uh, try to form a split between, in the ranks of the Muslims, uh, those, let's say, who wished not to be in allegiance to the, uh, the British government and those who did. And he actually formed an alliance with the Hindus because of the fact that the, uh, and later researches turned up, of course, that this group was not only financially supported by the British, uh, but it was done so for a specific reason, and that was basically to try to uh, have the Muslims in India to subjugate themselves to the British crown. Uh, furthermore, we find, in, uh, we find that in uh, Iraq, and of course later in Iran, of course they had the uh, uh, advent of the Baha'is. And then of course in uh, here, when we take it into a, uh, a more regional type of context, uh, we find that at the turn of the century, that there was uh, a number of people at the late 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, people like uh, Father or Divine, Daddy Grace, Prophet Jones, uh, Noble Drew Ali, and others, who either claimed prophethood or claimed to be some sort of uh, messianic type of leader, where they all had, at their respective times, various followings in different American cities. I just mis mentioned that because of the fact that all of these elements have, in some way, weave themselves into the belief system of the so-called nation of Islam, whether a person wishes to accept it or not. Because the established record, as I will display tonight, inshallah ta'ala, will prove that. Um, I can say that um, this is something, this is a type of topic, actually, which um, I started on some years ago. And at the time in which I started it, I had no idea, really, when I started on it, that it was going to uh, take on the type of... Um, elements and the type of breath, really, that it has uh, expanded to. And some of the things, of course, which I uncovered, some of you tonight might find uh, shocking. Uh, some of these things uh, help to dismantle a lot of the myths that are still being perpetrated to this very day concerning the origins of this group, concerning certain people that have looked upon as being the, uh, the originators of this group, and so on. And as well as establishing the actual belief system point by point, showing where this particular group differs in aspects of Aqidah with that of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, or the consensus of the Muslims. Uh, so, basically, inshallah ta'ala, we find that uh, in the late 1930s, or in the early, I'm sorry, in the late uh, 1900s, or the late... <laughs> the late 1910s, around the year 1918 through the early 1920s, uh, there was a man who came to the United States uh, from New Zealand, whose name was uh, Wallace Dodd Ford. Wallace Ford was born of a, um, a British father and a, Maori, a Polynesian Maori uh, mother. And he came to the United States, settled in California, and established himself at that point in time basically as a uh, seller of drugs and as a person who uh, managed to put together a very slick type of um, con game. As we say, uh, yani, he was basically uh, using this as a means of, in order to fleece people out of their money. Nonetheless, uh, this particular individual became known in later years as uh, W.D. Ford or uh, W.D. Fard, W.F. Uh, Muhammad, as well as a number of other names that have been attributed to him. Uh, what I wanted to do, inshallah ta'ala, is uh, share with you some of this, which I've managed to put on transparency so that uh, you can all see it, 
and uh, know specifically how far back this particular uh, group goes? As I was stating that the, uh, that the group itself actually started, as I said, in the, um, in the late 1930s, or the late 1920s, or the midnight, or the late teens through the early 1920s. At that period of time, actually, there was a uh, group which some of you may have heard about called the Moore Science Temple. The Moore Science Temple's leader or originator was this man by the name of uh, Timothy Drew, who later became known as uh, Noble Drew Ali. He actually employed a number of concepts which came from Christianity, some which came from Islam, but a majority of which came from uh, ideas of black nationalism, and he sort of mingled it together and called it Islam. Uh, from this, we find that uh, Wallace Ford, who I was mentioning before, was the uh, uh, dope salesman. After he was uh, committed to, uh, to jail in San Quentin Prison in California for selling drugs, he was later released around 1926, and he migrated at that time to Detroit, Michigan, to this same city. And in fact, uh, his, uh, his birth records actually prove something that, uh, so, uh, I should say, actually disprove a myth which has been perpetrated by some members of the so-called Nation of Islam, where they try to say, for example, that uh, he was a black man and that uh, he was born in Mecca. And some even go to the extent of saying that, uh, well, he wasn't born in Mecca, but rather he was born in the Mideast. Some say he was of, uh, of uh, uh, Palestinian origin. Some say he was Pakistani and so on. Anyway, his birth record, if you look here, it states, in fact, his race or his birthplace except, itself was New Zealand. His race, white. And, of course, uh, this is from the, uh, taken, of course, from the birth record of his son, who uh, was born also in California, in Los Angeles, in 19, uh, uh, 1923. Nonetheless, uh, he was, this was a, this, uh, which, which I'm showing you now, was actually taken from an expose, which came out in the uh, Los Angeles uh, Herald Examiner in 1963. And it came from some records which they themselves went through in order to try to track down the origin of this particular group. In fact, we find that even today, some of you are probably familiar with this photograph uh, that has been pretty much circulated by, uh, by the nation and by some of their offshoots uh, to this very day regarding uh, Yanni, uh, the, uh, Elijah, his son, W.D. And of course, if you notice, of course, this uh, in the background where they have this uh, individual back here, which of course is the same individual here who is uh, Wallace Ford. But basically, it states here, for example, in the article, it says that the black Muslims by the thousands uh, pay homage, he said, to Wallace Ford. He said they're the so-called prophet from Mecca. He said in their mistaken belief that he is the founder, he said, of the black supremacy cult, that he is one of their own. It goes on to state that his uh, name, of course, is Wallace Dodd. He was born in New Zealand on February 26th of 1891. Uh, the interesting thing concerning this is the fact that uh, even though... For example, his names might change. Some of the uh, birth records of themselves, not the birth records, I'm sorry, but rather some of the uh, uh, aliases might change. One of the things that remains consistent concerning him is, number one, his fingerprints and, of course, his photographs. They're always consistent. And whether it be coming from, uh, the, um, uh, from San Quentin records or from the uh, California State of uh, Investigation or whether it came from the, uh, from the FBI, all of which you'll find that there's a consistency between all of these particular records. In fact, one of the uh, common myths that is perpetrated, of course, by the uh, uh, Nation of Islam is that the man was ousted from Detroit, Michigan, uh, because, as they say, they said that he was pre preaching such a powerful message that he was chased out of uh, Detroit, Michigan, and they still refer to him to this very day as being a law on earth. Uh, the fact is, is the reason in which he was ousted out of Detroit was because of a human sacrifice that took place 
1932, which is reported by the Detroit uh, Free Press and, of course, the Detroit News. And, in fact, it was, uh, this particular human sacrifice was done as a result of a set of principles which he himself developed along with Elijah Muhammad, who later became known as the leader, of course, of the Nation of Islam. Anyway, one of the uh, things concerning this, um, I'm being I'm sort of like going through time now. Uh, one of the interesting things concerning this particular expose, which, which came out in 1963, which of course was 30 years after uh, the man himself you know, appeared on the streets of Detroit, uh, was that they were so shocked by the Los Angeles Herald Examiner uh, expose that they put forth in their newspaper a challenge of $100,000 in order to prove that uh, this man was actually the teacher of Elijah Muhammad. One of the, in, one of the uh, things that was, is pointed out by uh, Carl Evans, who was the author of a book entitled The Judas Factor, which uh, came out about three years ago, he points out the fact that one of the people who was witness to this challenge that came out in 1963 was uh, Malcolm X. And he said that, um, that whenever a person puts forth a challenge like this, that is of $100,000 in order to prove someone wrong, you have to take the money and put, put it in what is called escrow. Escrow literally means, Yanni, that uh, in the event that somebody should come forth with proof in order to challenge this, um, this, uh, this reward, then uh, you can come and you know, re uh, recover your money. However, Elijah never did this. It was done basically as a ploy in order to uh, yani, solidify his own rank, solidify his own followers. Because what happened was that after he put forth that challenge, uh, he uh, and the wife of, um, of Wallace Ford put, sent him a letter which was dated in 1963. She had it signed by a uh, lawyer, a Los Angeles lawyer, and sent it specifically to Elijah Muhammad, stating basically, he said, you put forth the challenge of $100,000 that this man is not your teacher. Here is the proof that he is your teacher. Hand me over my money. Okay? And of course, Elijah never complied. But one of the interesting things concerning this is the fact that even though he didn't comply, this was something which really shook the confidence of a lot of his major uh, followers at that time because they said if Elijah is going to uh, back down they said from this challenge then what or how much more so about the things that he's been teaching us for example he used to teach Elijah used to teach of course that not only this man that we see here is the creator of the heavens and earth uh, but he also used to claim that uh, this man he said was born he said of a uh, Jewish mother whose name was uh, Baby G and he said his father was named Alfonso and um he also claimed, of course, that there was a, um, that there was a, <laughs> a UFO, which he called the, uh, the mother plane, which later became known as the mothership, in which he claimed that, the, that it was piloted, he said, by 13 Japanese youth, he said, who uh, used to uh, constantly revolve around the earth, he said, waiting to unleash nuclear destruction upon white people. Now, I know a lot of that might sound silly, but it's what's even crazier is that people actually believed that type of ideology. What I've done, however, in order to break down that, is to actually show that a lot of these concepts that were really taught by the Nation of Islam, in reality, were taken not just simply from the ideas of Wallace Ford and Elijah, but actually the Jehovah Witnesses. And there's a, there's a lot of significant similarities between the two groups because of the fact that the Jehovah Witnesses actually came, uh, were originated in the late 1800s, just prior to uh, the beginning of the 20th century when they claimed, for example, that uh, the world was coming to an end. So you'll find a lot of doctrinal similarities between the two groups. For example, one of the primary things that uh, Elijah used to teach is this concept which he called Yaqub's history. And Yaqub's history is really forms the basis of NOI doctrine. Because from this particular ideology, they claim that, a, uh, that they were, at one point in time, about 6,000 years ago, according to Elijah Muhammad, he said that uh, whites, he said, were genetically grafted he said, from, a, uh, from black people, uh, from a subhuman race of devils, and that they were created by, as he said, a big-headed black scientist on the, uh, on the Mediterranean Isle of Patmos. And he also said that uh, the whites would rule the world for 6,000 years and then be destroyed at the end of their time, he said, by blacks, who he portrayed as being uh, angelic scientist gods. So, uh, and he also claimed, however, 
even though he said this in his other books, for example, like uh, Our Savior Has Arrived uh, and Message to the Black Man, which were two of his primary texts, he stated in there at the same time that even though, as he said, yeah, okay, now, even though he stated, for example, that, um, that, Whites were a genetically grafted race, as he said. He said at the same time that Adam, Eve, Moses, and Isa bin Maryam, or Jesus the son of Mary, were all white. So it would seem, if anybody you know, who has any kind of common sense would say, well, if white people are devils, then how is it you're going to see that these prophets, are you saying that these prophets are also devils? You know, that, that uh, Adam was a devil and, you know, Musa was a devil and so on. Uh, but anyways, a lot of these things we find, for example, in some of his books, one of which, of course, is... Uh, this last one, which he came out with in, uh, just prior to his death, called Our Savior Has Arrived. And um, this particular book, as I said, is very phenomenal because of the fact that it was the last published text prior to his death in 1975. And in fact, you find in here a challenge uh, which he puts forth to anyone who says that he is not the messenger of Allah. In fact, he even goes, he becomes more specific by saying that he is the messenger of Allah to you all. So he believed that his, that his mission was not just simply to, uh, as many people say, just the blacks of America, but literally to every Muslim on the face of the earth. As I was stating, that you find like a lot of similarities. For example, the, um, the Jehovah Witnesses, they have this concept uh, which um, was developed by their founder, Charles T. Russell, where he claimed, of course, that uh, there was a, that white, I'm sorry, that God left man in the care of angels who ran afoul of the divine scheme of things by mixing with human beings genetically to produce this gigantic you know, mismatch of, uh, of beings. And he said that Christ came to earth through a process of genetic transfer. And in case any of you have the Jehovah's Witnesses that knock on your door, you, know, you can always confront them with this particular belief of theirs. So this is exactly what they believe to this day. The nation itself, Yaakov's history, derives its entire origin from this particular concept. And it's no real coincidence because of the fact that Elijah, what he used to do in a lot of his radio uh, broadcast, or rather, uh, Charles Russell and Thomas Rutherford, who were the two, uh, the president and the second in charge of the Jehovah Witnesses in the 1920s and 1930s, what they did is that they used to give a radio broadcast. And they used to do this fairly regularly. And of course, at that time, Elijah, and if you look in Message of the Black Man, he states it very clearly, that he used to order his followers in order to listen to Rutherford, and he calls him Dr. Rutherford. And Dr. Rutherford, he's referring to, is this man, Charles Rutherford, who was the second in charge of the Jehovah Witnesses. Additionally, the Jehovah Witnesses used to claim that the year 1914 was the end of time. And if you look in NOI doctrine, they also claim that time ended in 1914. However, any person might want to think, well, you know, that was what, almost 75, 80 years ago, almost 100 years ago. The thing is, is that they claim that even though time ended in 1914, they said Allah delayed the end of the world so that all blacks could hear Islam before he will end it. This is their justification as to why we're still, you know, here. You know, because if you follow their logic, we should all be in, in Jinnah right now or, you know, elsewhere. Uh, the concept of um, the 144,000. This concept is one which uh, is a primary point of the Jehovah Witnesses. Because they, according to Jehovah Witnesses, they say that 144,000 people, 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses, they said will survive the so-called Battle of Armageddon when uh, they claim that uh, the Antichrist will come, they said, and the Christians will fight him and so forth. And they said that they will survive it and they said that they will rule in heaven with Isa and Maryam. However, the NOI, they extracted the same doctrine and they said that 144,000 blacks, they said, will survive the Armageddon. They said since Allah permitted Elijah to, con to only convert that specific number to Islam, quote-unquote. So basically, as you notice, if you follow me along, you'll see that a lot of these concepts, uh, all he's done basically is just reinterpret a lot of them. Uh, the new world on earth. According to um, the uh, Watchtower Society of Jehovah's Witnesses, they said that the world would not be destroyed but will abide forever. They claim that there will be an earthly class uh, which will be saved from the Battle of Armageddon to create Allah's new world on earth. Elijah Muhammad reinterpreted this. He said, that, uh, he said that the world would not be physically destroyed, 
but it will exist for many thousands of years. In fact, what he, he went on beyond that, and he said that uh, every 25,000 years, Allah creates a new scripture, which he uses in order to uh, yani, be as a new sharia. In fact, he said that there were several scientists, he said several black scientists who, who joined together, who form a measure every 24,000 24, years, in order to come about with this new type of scripture. And he said that the Quran, he said, was just one of those scriptures. So in other words, he didn't believe that the Qur'an was the final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Additionally, regarding the hereafter, the Jehovah Witnesses claim they not only deny the existence of life after death, uh, but they also state that uh, the human soul ceases to exist at death. Uh, paradise, according to them, is on earth, and uh, hell is something that, um, yani that a person goes through basically in this life. Elijah took the same concept when he said, when you're dead, you're dead. And he went on to say that further, that uh, you make your own heaven and hell right here on earth. And then we come to the concept of the mothership, as I was stating before. That whole concept doesn't come, interestingly enough, from the Jehovah Witnesses. However, it does come from a lot of evangelical Christian groups who basically have this concept of what they call the rapture, or, as they say, the uh, Ezekiel's wheel, which they interpret from various verses in the Bible. So what Elijah did was that he combined these two concepts, that is his concept of the rapture and Ezekiel's wheel, and he put it into this, uh, and he blended also Marcus Garvey's concept of the so-called Black Star Liner. Now Marcus Garvey was one of these other uh, messianic leaders in the early uh, part of the century who said that he was getting this liner in order to take black people back to Africa. So all that Elijah did was just combine the same concept along with the biblical concepts and came up with this UFO thing and said, you know, there's this UFO that orbits around the earth and it's waiting to uh, take us all away from, you know, oppression. Today, however, we find that a lot of these groups, uh, of course, have blended into a multiplicity of sects. And today we find that some of these concepts, of course, have gone to the extent of uh, developing groups that have led to people like Louis Farrakhan, people like uh, Silas Muhammad. John Muhammad, some of them probably you've never heard of. John Muhammad, in fact, is right here in Detroit. He just happens to be the brother of Elijah Muhammad, and he claims to be the only one who has actually held on to the original beliefs of his brother. And for those of you maybe who saw uh, the Million Man March on television or whatever, uh, possibly saw him when he mounted the podium with Louis Farrakhan, and Louis Farrakhan pointed and he said, yeah, we're now joining together in unity. But here... What I've done is to break down the uh, distinction between the beliefs of the nation of Islam, contrasting them with the beliefs of Ahl sunnah Because as Muslims, of course, one of the primary things, of course, that we believe in is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne in a manner which befits his majesty. He is not like his creation. He doesn't indwell within his creation, nor does his creation indwell in, in him. Elijah, on the other hand, rejects this totally because of the fact that their whole concept is based on the fact that uh, all black men are gods and according to him the best of this, these gods, or as he said the supreme god is a human angel named Allah who came in the form of W. Fard Muhammad on the streets of Detroit, Michigan in, in July of 1930 and he went on to say that as I was stating previously you know that Allah has a father named Alfonso and a Jewish mother named Baby G uh, Farrakhan, on the other hand, <laughs> Farrakhan, on the other hand, what he's done, now keep in mind, I, what I've done basically with this chart is uh, break, it in, break it down in sections. In the uh, first row is basically the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah, the Sunnis. The second row, the beliefs of Elijah Muhammad, to show you specifically what it was that he himself believed with respect, for example, to the concept of Allah, finality of prophethood, and others which I have to show you, which will come uh, sequentially. But here, but also the beliefs, for example, of Louis Farrakhan, John, and Silas Muhammad, the beliefs of W.D. Muhammad, and then the beliefs of the Qadianis, with respect to all of these things. And showing you not just simply the differences between each and every group, but much more so towards the end, if you notice, with W.D. Muhammad and the Qadianis, the actual similarity between the beliefs of the Qadianis and the present day belief of W.D., and more specifically, contrasting the beliefs of W.D. with that of his father, Farrakhan, and that of Ahl Sunnah. So, we find that Farrakhan, he basically holds the same belief as Elijah. Uh, however, he maintains that Fard Muhammad is not the creator of the heavens and earth. And we have him on tape actually saying this. He says, in fact, on tape that 
He said, I would be a fool if I believed such a, such a thing. Yet when he came to the Million Man March, he said something completely different. Uh, anyway, they do refer to, they've, they've now basically turned or twisted their uh, belief in respect of this, or modified it, where they call Elijah Muhammad the, uh, the Lord, Savior, Redeemer, and Messiah. W.D., uh, let's say, unlike, his, uh, unlike some of the beliefs of uh, his father, and then also somewhat similar to his father, he sometimes pushes a pantheistic type of doctrine. In other words, his concept that Allah is everywhere and in everything. He, um, he, sa he said on a number of occasions on tape that Allah is the only real. And this is a concept, Yanni, which basically comes from the Sufis, where they claim that the only thing that even exists is Allah, and that everything else is just you know, a figment of one's imagination and it's not really real. Well, this is something that W.D. has said time and time again on, in some of his talks and so forth. Uh, he also refers to him by certain concepts. In fact, in his writings, he's even stated such things as saying that Allah has a mind, a brain, breath, nostrils, and personalities. Now, of course, uh, someone might consider that as being, you know, yani, something which completely goes against the belief of Ahasana. But again, what I've done here is in order to show you the similarity between that belief and that of the Qadianis. Because according to the Qadianis, they not only endorse or have these same type of pantheistic doctrines, but they also believe that uh, Allah prays, Allah fasts, Allah sleeps, and He is made of ivory. This is what they say, according to their own writings. Uh, and Ghulam Ahmed himself, he once referred to himself as being the manifestation of God. And this is uh, very significant, and inshallah we'll get into that in uh, a short while, because uh, this is a, a statement which W.D. made in uh, 1975, which they even printed in their paper, and which uh, today they try to say, well, you know, he no longer uh, uh, adheres to that concept, and, you know, I'll give him the benefit of, of the doubt that probably he doesn't, but the point is, is that there's nothing uh, documented to say that he has disavowed that. Nonetheless, in respect of finality of prophethood, finality of prophet, I really believe, personally, is really the essence of a lot of these groups. As I was stating at the outset, that one thing that all of these groups have, the common link, the basic link, that all of these groups have together is in denying the finality of prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Basically, they wish to compete with him in his prophethood. They don't wish to acknowledge that he was who he said he was. That is, yani khatim and nabihin. They wish to deny this in any way, shape, form, or fashion. They wish to say, for example, that they too are uh, capable of receiving revelation, that they too are capable of establishing a sharia, that they too are capable of bringing forth and being divine legislators for mankind in the same way as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was. So, we find that Elijah, of course he claimed himself not just simply to be the uh, last messenger of Allah, but he said that his was more specific, because he said that since Allah sent prophets, he said to every nation, he, he said, was sent to the black man of America. And he said that uh, he taught that uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa message was limited uh, he said that the Quran, as I was stating before, he said it was created by 24 black scientists who met every 25,000 years to create a new scripture. He claimed that the Quran was revealed to him, even though his book, which was entitled Message to the Black Man, uh, was, usually, was actually used as the Quran and the Sharia of that movement. In fact, he stated in one of his writings, he said that after him, he said it was going to come God himself. And this actually yani, has a link to the statement of uh, W.D., his first major statement in 1975 when he called himself the manifestation of God. Because you have to understand, Yanni, that, that there's a uh, connection here between, and I'm summarizing a great deal, uh, there's a connection here with respect to the concept of telling a group of people who have been indoctrinated for more than 40 years that your leader is the messenger of Allah and that Allah is a man. There's a connection between that and then that person who calls himself the messenger of Allah, saying that after me will come God himself. Then his son, who comes later, who for the first 42 years of his life has been yani, uh, taught his father's doctrines, he in his first major speech announces to his people that I am the manifestation of God. So immediately it, it puts an idea in the followers that, ah, this is, divine, this is a divine decree. 
Elijah said that after him was going to come God himself. And here he is. So, Farrakhan, of course, uh, and John Muhammad, uh, they pretty much maintain the same belief as Elijah. That is, that uh, Elijah Muhammad, as they believe, is the last messenger of Allah. Uh, but they also state a concept which is taken directly from the Qadianis, where they say that, uh, that Muhammad wasallam was the last of the law-bearing prophets. And when they say that, Yani, what they try to do is that they try to drive a wedge, and they try to open up a doorway with which to deny the finality of prophet of, prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam by saying that even though he was revealed the Quran, yes, he's a prophet. He was revealed the Quran. I wasn't. Re- nothing was revealed to me. Okay. Although I am also a prophet. They even go beyond that and they try to say. Uh, some of them even say, well, he didn't call himself a prophet. He called himself a messenger of God. You know, yani, and basically you'll find that there's a that to call to, for someone to call himself a messenger of God is worse than calling yourself a prophet. Because in, to, in the first case, we find as a general rule, according to the uh, scholars of, of uh, Tawheed, that a uh, person, let's say, that, or that every prophet, we find, uh, is not necessarily a messenger. Because every prophet, Yani, was sent in order to convey the message of Tawheed to mankind, to call people to worship Allah alone and to not associate anything with him. The distinction between that and a messenger is that a messenger generally comes with a scripture which generally abrogates or enforces laws which did not exist before. So in other words, you find people, for example, like uh, Musa, he was, a, he was a prophet as well as a messenger. We find people, for example, like Isa, he was a prophet as well as a messenger. We find people like Muhammad, وسلم, who was a prophet and a messenger. Okay, why? Because in each three cases, they were all sent a scripture. Yet, we find someone say, for example, like Suleiman, he was a prophet, but he was not a messenger. We find someone like Shu'aib, who was a prophet, but he was not a messenger, and so on. So there are distinctions between the two. So when a person calls himself the messenger of Allah, when a person calls himself Rasulullah, he is basically saying that he has been sent a risala, a scripture. So a person who calls himself a messenger of Allah is worse than calling himself a Nabi. Because he's basically sent, saying that I too have been sent a revelation to uh, a Sharia code and law to, to use over my people. You see? And this is why, you know, Elijah, when he referred to his, uh, his so-called book, Message to the Black Man, this is like a subtle you know, stab at the Sunnis in order to say, yeah, you want to challenge me as being the messenger of Allah? Well, here's my message. And in fact, we have documented evidence to show that he actually, that this was his, the reasoning behind him saying that. Anyway, uh, again, to be very brief, and inshallah, I'm going to just rush through some of these. We find that uh, WD, in 1994, in the 1994 issue of Muslim Journal, referred to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam also as being the last of the law-bearing prophets, which is the same concept which comes from the Qadianis. Uh, he himself, in fact, has uh, re- stated on a number of occasions that he has claimed to uh, be the recipient of revelation. Uh, to be the embodiment of, uh, of Isa, of Muhammad, of Bilal, and uh, of claiming to uh, an ability to perform prophetic mi- miracles. And also going on to state in an article which came out just um, in January of last year, where he stated that um, uh, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Drew Ali, and Martin Luther King, and others, others, quote-unquote, also received revelation. Yeah. Anyway, some, a lot of these, of course, as I said, basically, as you can see from the chart, pretty much come in their origin from the, uh, the Qadianis themselves. Also, with respect to Iman and Kufr, or belief and unbelief, we find that, um, uh, yani, that belief and unbelief with respect to Elijah was really defined upon what he decreed to be Iman and Kufr, what he decreed to be belief and unbelief. And that, as I stated previously, he claimed that all Muslims throughout the world are obligated to follow him. Farrakhan and John, they pretty much maintain the same belief. Silas retains the same standard, of course, as Elijah, and he only differs in, just in his style and his emphasis. Yet all three of them totally reject the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah. They reject Sunnis and they claim, say that all you Sunni Muslims are ignorant and blind because of the fact that you don't reject or you don't accept Elijah Muhammad as being your prophet. Uh, W.D. in respect of Iman and Kufr, and this is where it gets very complex. 
Because basically what he's done is that he's managed to uh, weave a lot of um, uh, Kadiani, humanistic, and pantheistic concepts and thrown them together, as well as New Age beliefs, this uh, Yani movement which uh, say, states that, you know, that the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Taoists, and all of them are all one people, okay, and that they're all, quote-unquote, Muslim by nature. Okay, he's pretty much like pushed this uh, in, in and amongst his people, and regretfully a lot of them have begun to accept this particular concept. So as a result, all faiths, according to him, are deemed as being valid and as a way that will lead a person to Jannah. And this is a concept which directly, again, comes from the Qadianis, because the Qadianis believe that Buddhists, Zoroastrians, and Hindus, they all put in the same context as, as they say, people of the book. And if you look at any of their books, it says that directly. Uh, with respect to uh, Isa ibn Maryam, or Jesus, they, uh, they state, of course, uh, there was a lot of contradictory concepts which uh, Elijah used to hold on to. And they were always racially based. Uh, he stated, for example, in summary, that Jesus was, is dead and that he will never physically return. Although, he said, that W. Fard Muhammad, this man who he said was a law in person, who he met on the streets of Detroit, Michigan, was, who he said was put in jail in 1932, uh, he said that, um, he, said he's, that he, was, he was a Caucasian, and he's a combination of Allah, the Messiah, and the Mahdi. And uh, he also held that all white people were sort of like implicitly held to be the uh, personification of Dajjal, or the Antichrist. Um, with respect to W.D., he's actually, you, you find that there's a lot of his present-day beliefs which uh, spring off from this one particular concept. And what I've done, basically, is try to summarize a lot of them. A, he holds that Jesus is dead and that he will never physically return. He also holds that, um, that all of his followers are, are symbolically uh, Jesus, he holds that he himself is the combination of the Messiah and the Mahdi. This is why he refers to himself as, quote-unquote, spokesman for human salvation. And that's when, because his term, spokesman for human salvation, by, by, in its reality, if you take it back to its origin, and if you look, uh, is Mary, and he claims also that uh, Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the return, was the return of Isa ibn Maryam. He also states that uh, this whole concept of Dajjal is something mythical. It's a fairy tale. It's not something that's really real. Uh, all of this actually is almost directly taken from the Qadianis. Now, uh, there's an announcement for uh, Brother Abdul Hadi. Uh, is Abdul Hadi in the room? Because your, your children are looking for you. Okay. Tight. Matrimonial precepts, okay? Uh, somebody raised this point, I think, somewhat earlier in maybe one of the other sessions uh, about um, yeah, I mean, uh, matrimonial precepts uh, among some of these groups. But anyway, uh, the point is, is that uh, with respect to uh, Elijah, Elijah never had, for example, a uh, clear position on, uh, on the Islamic uh, view of uh, polygyny or plural marriage. However, uh, he was known, of course, to, of being the father of 13 illegitimate children you know, that he got from at least, uh, at least uh, nine different women, uh, who today both Louis Farrakhan and W.D. both refer to as being, quote-unquote, uh, Elijah's wives, even though it was well known in 1963 when these things first took place that they called him his girlfriend. Um, the, since uh, W.D. refers to every person, basically, as being, quote-unquote, Muslim by nature, he thereby rules it permissible for women of his community to marry non-Muslims. And that's why, uh, in, uh, in fact, he also goes beyond that in stating that uh, polygyny is generally discouraged, uh, and he claims that it's an exception, not a rule, and it's only allowable with orphans and under extreme and unusual circumstances. So when a person starts to put like all of these various regulations upon it, a person basically starts to say, oh, basically, it's, it makes it almost next to haram. He... Uh, has also stated this uh, fabricated hadith where he says that uh, one is best for you if you but knew it. And uh, he has also stated that uh, any blacks who desire more than one wife are cursed by God. And uh, like Farrakhan, he also refers to uh, Elijah's uh, girlfriends as being Elijah's wives. Basically, of course, uh, the, the Qadiani, this whole concept, Yani, of uh, a person or of 
let's say, people of outside the uh, uh, the realm of Ahl al-Kitab being permissible for, um, to, for marriage. In, in Islam, we find that with, uh, with a Muslim man, it is permissible for the Muslim man, let's say, to marry a Jew or a Christian under specific conditions. However, with respect to a Muslim woman, a Muslim woman it is impermissible for her, of course, to marry a non-Muslim. It's absolutely impermissible, as is stated by Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an. However, uh, the Qadiani, since they put this broad definition of the Buddhists, the Hindus, and the Zoroastrians, all as being people of the book, this is why you will find amongst them that they will intermarry amongst these people. And this is even more reason uh, to call the Qadianis as being mushriks. Seeing Allah. Um, according to um, Elijah, he claims, as I said, to have spoken to Allah face to face on the streets of Detroit, Michigan. Um, <laughs> the, pardon me? Oh, which street? Yeah, mashallah. I don't know. He, he may have been going through his revelation at the time. You know, Allah knows best. Yeah. He may have been in trance. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we find that uh, Farrakhan, Silas, John, all of them pretty much accept that same basic principle. Uh, in fact, uh, Silas goes even further than that. He says that based on this principle, Eli- Elijah is Musa. And the reason he, takes, he, he says this is because of the fact that when you look at the, in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says that he was the one who spoke to Moses directly. So, uh, Silas says, aha, he said, you see, he said, here's the proof. You see, if, uh, Elijah spoke to Allah face to face, just like Musa. So he tries to make the analogy by saying that the Quran is speaking about Elijah Muhammad. Here, um, although uh, W.D. has stated in one of his tapes, he says that he claims that uh, the first contact that you had, and not in one of his tapes, I take that back, in one of his books uh, entitled The, uh, the Teachings of, uh, of uh, W.D. Muhammad, and this, of course, is the so-called answer book. It's, this is just taken from a huge book which they came out with in 1976 through 77. And in it, if a person should go through this book from page to page, you will find things in here, Yanni, which totally go against the beliefs of, uh, of Islam. But uh, nonetheless, this particular book, uh, you find a lot of the ideas. And in fact, one, one interesting thing about it is the uh, picture that he has up there with his fingers pointing up to the head with the word Qur'an on there because this is, this is very one, one of the interesting things about all of these groups and one of the things that, actually I apologize to everyone that I failed to mention at the beginning was uh, a, the entrance of a group at the early stages of Islam called the Bataniya the Bataniya were literally a, a group which held that uh, the, the Qur'an was like a um, was like a shell oh, I'm sorry it was like a, a nut and they said that a nut, they said, has its, uh, its outer shell, they said, and its inner husk. They said for those people, for example, who would read the Qur'an, read the Hadith, you would get one particular meaning, and that meaning that you would get would be like the outer realm of that nut. Okay? But for those people who should look to the inner meaning, you would get a completely different understanding. So they said that when you get that outer meaning, they said that you, know, you have, like, as they say, like a very childish kind of understanding of the scriptures. But if you rise to the higher levels where you get to understand the inner meanings, the real meanings, as they would say, uh, then you would have an understanding that makes you, you know, higher than that of the scholars. And this is something that, uh, regretfully, uh, this man has really pushed with uh, this uh, picture here because the picture really refers to a concept that he used to call the divine mind. And the divine mind, in his, uh, according to his definition, was something where every person is able to come with his own tafsir. Every person is able to come with his own individual understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Again, this is where it starts to get interesting. With respect to the unseen, and of course with hijab. Uh, with respect to the unseen, of course, as Muslims, you know, we believe that, these, that uh, such things as angels and jinns, these are aspects of Allah's creation, which of course... Yes? Oh, Qadr. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll have to go back to it, inshallah. Yeah, my mistake. Yes, with respect to Qadr. Um, according to uh, Elijah, he claimed that there is no fixed time for a person to die and that you can live for a thousand years or as long as you wish. This is what he said in his book, How to Eat to Live, both volume one and two. 
In fact, in volume two, he stated, he said that you can live forever if you wish. I find it kind of strange as to what, or, well, of course, then you find like some of uh, Farrakhan's followers today who claim that Elijah isn't dead. You know, and this, some of them, this is why, in fact, this is one of the reasons that when Farrakhan said uh, just two weeks prior to the Million Man March that he, that he had a, a journey up to the mothership where he convert, or rather conversed with Elijah, you know, and this is further proof that Elijah is not, according to Farrakhan, this is further proof why, Far, or why Elijah is not dead. You know, even I get sort of crossed up by some of that nonsense. Anyway, uh, he stated that uh, prosperity is achieved by doing for self, and that adversity, in other words, when anything bad happens to you, is because of white oppression. So, uh, Yanni, all of these ideas, you know, is, has like a racial type of uh, connection. It has connections also to some of the strangest type of ideas, Yanni, which come from aspects of Christianity, which come from aspects of uh, just sheer con artistry, etc., uh, with respect to Louis Farrakhan, he basically has the same type of idea. Although in 1985, in 1986, excuse me, he, uh, some of his followers claimed that Halley's Comet, which uh, was in the uh, headlines, of course, at that time, they claimed that this was a divine omen that Elijah Muhammad was still alive. You know, Allah knows best as to how they derived that. You know, but uh, anyway. Uh, as far as uh, W.D. goes, he claims that... Um, he has a very, also a very contradictory doctrine with respect to, to Qatar. He, um, he professes belief in it, okay, and I'll give him the credit for, do, for doing that. However, at the same time, he claims that his leadership, his own leadership, he said is based on this man, who he calls Fard, allegedly writing his name, meaning W.D.'s name, on a door in, 19, in the 1930s, uh, stating that, uh, or telling Elijah, that uh, when your son becomes of age, he's going to be the leader of your movement. And not only that, that uh, the, the name of your son will be Warwick. You know, so he wrote this supposedly on the door in the 1930s, and this is something that he's repeated uh, over the years. He even declared in February, on, uh, some years ago, in the late 1970s, that an eclipse that occurred uh, was a sign from Allah proving that his claim to leadership is to be chosen over Farrakhan and Silas. And the reason he was saying this was because of the fact that at that point in time there was a lot of dissension going on in that community with regards to who they were going to follow, whether it was going to be Farrakhan or it was going to be Silas. And uh, a lot of them had managed to pull away a significant number of people you know, from that group. So he had to come now with this concept of uh, using yani, uh, you know, uh, omens in the stars to say to his followers, you know, oh, look in the stars, you know, there's a, a proof that I should be followed. Again, uh, this is a concept re really which ties itself back to the beliefs of the Qadianis. Now, with respect to, um, to uh, unseen beings, according to Elijah, he said that the white man is a devil and of course black men are angels. He called belief in the unseen spookism, you know, and said that, uh, you know, you, all, you Sunnis believe in all that spooky stuff. You know, I'm sure that some of you who have probably had like you know run-ins with him have heard the same thing, or some of you say who may have even believed in that nonsense before. You know, probably even said the same thing. The point is, is that even though he said this, he endorsed and taught this concept, as I was stating earlier, of the mother plane or the mothership. You know, this 13 Japanese youths, you know, in this orbiting around the world. So even though you want, and yet, and there's no doubt, of course, that that's a, a form of belief in the unseen, because you know he used to have a lot of his followers, who, when you speak to some of his quote-unquote pioneers. They will tell you how they stood out on, uh, you know, the porch or something like in the summer, uh, summer nights and would look up at the sky waiting for the mothership to descend. You know, it's sad, but these are things that they actually used to do. Uh, Farrakhan, on the other hand, in 1985, of course, and as well as just uh, in September, I believe it was, he also claims to have, you know, had communication with uh, this UFO. Huh? Yeah, sure. I might have to take it out of the jacket in order to uh, focus it a bit more, but I think that's about as, as focused as that can be. I don't know how that is for everybody here. I know it's probably not that clear for the sisters, but I'm sure I'll try to do my best with respect to focusing it. Um, anyway, uh, the, um, with respect to W.D., he claims that, the, uh, uh, that angels means the nature of things. He calls, he's been known to call uh, Satan symbolic and says that there's no such thing as a spirit walking around without flesh. Uh, on the one hand, he affirms belief in jinns, yet he refers to them as, he's been known to refer to them as being Gentiles, Jacobites, foreigners, and passions. And uh, he later, 
maintain that belief in unseen beings, as was stated in his book, um, uh, An African American Genesis, which uh, came out, I believe, it was in 1886, where he stated that to believe in unseen, in the, in unseen beings is uh, voodoo and superstition. Uh, all of these things, again, have a direct uh, connection with the beliefs of the Qadianis. With respect to hijab, I don't think I have to get too you know, elaborate with respect to that. Because there was this thing which they switch, uh, uh, even in Elijah's time, of course, they used to you know, cover with this type of uniform type of covering. And uh, which even today, they still somewhat maintain in Farrakhan's group. However, in WD's group, they state that uh, all that uh, is required for a woman is quote-unquote modesty. And uh, whether the woman is covered or uncovered, and this is one of the reasons, of course, and I'll show you from some of the documents, if some of you have probably noticed, I see this huge uh, folder that I have up here is just uh, a collection of some of their uh, some of their gems, you know, from their own stuff. Uh, but um, he's basically stated a woman's hair can be considered their hijab, and uh, that, um, of course, it's well known, of course, that they are known to wear very flashy type of styles when they do cover, and they refer to it as being, uh, you know, Islamic or cultural type dress. Um, anyway. Again, a lot of this, of course, comes or has a, somewhat of a relationship to that of the Qadianis. Now, this is where we come to the good part. As I've been stating all throughout this talk, basically, is about the, uh, the connection there of, uh, or with the Qadianis. And I realize we're running a little short of time. I sort of like overextended myself. But anyway, here we have a... Uh, here we have basically proof from a early edition of um, of uh, Bilalian news, or as they uh, this is one of um, which now refers to itself as being a Muslim journal, uh, in which uh, it states here uh, of the, of a visit that took place in um, in 1976 uh, by one of the leaders of the Qadianis in uh, in Guyana, in which he states. He says here, he says, the rise of the true religion in the West, observed Ali, it was foreseen in the 1880s by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement. Ahmadiyya is a term that the Qadianis use for themselves, uh, where they try to give themselves legitimacy. But it's basically the same meaning. Qadiani Ahmadiyya is referring to the same group. Uh, he said, uh, he entrusted his first follower, Maulana Muhammad Ali, the crucial task of translating the Holy Quran into English. He goes on to say, it is not coincidental that Master Fard Muhammad came to America with that translation. He goes on, he says that um, I wasn't. He said that he first met uh, W. D. Muhammad in 1971, and he says I wasn't surprised when he became chief minister. Chief minister, of course, was the uh, one of the titles that he used to use uh, many years ago. Here we have at that time the uh, world leader of the uh, Qadianis who came to visit uh, W. D. in his um, headquarters in Chicago. And it states here, he says, during his recent visit to Guyana, Chief Minister W.D. Muhammad, he said, was a distinguished guest of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Uh, so, um, you know, and again, this is just coming from their own material. So they can't say, of course, that this never took place. In the late 1970s, we see here, of course, where he even had uh, connections and uh, correspondence, of course, with... Uh, uh, of the Rashad Khalifa, the false prophet, the man who claimed that he was able to determine the day of judgment by computer calculation. And uh, here he states, the interesting thing here is not so much uh, his, uh, the photograph with, of course, uh, himself and Rashad Khalifa, but much more so what it states at the bottom of the page, where it states, for example, that there's a 20% discount for the readers of Bilalian News. So in other words, he's not only selling, of course, his cassettes his cassette and his books, to members of W.D. Muhammad's community, but also he is actually giving them a specific discount. And one of the things concerning this particular group is their rejection of the Sunnah. This is one of the primary things that they do. They claim that the Sunnah is something that uh, is a bunch of fairy tales and is something you shouldn't, you know, you should only follow the Quran and so forth. Yeah, it's totally rejected, in fact. Mujaddid? Oh, yeah, exactly. It says. Uh, Follow the teachings of our, of our beloved Mujaddid Imam Walasi Muhammad. He said, increase your knowledge of God's message to you, Quran and Al-Islam. Now, uh, this is something here which I find is very interesting because uh, on a tape in, um, 
in the late 19, uh, I, was, I believe it was 1987, 88, uh, W.D. made a statement of, state, of saying that um, he once stood before some of Elijah Muhammad's followers holding up the American flag and saying that America is the greatest land, that if you don't want to, if you don't want to hold it, I'll hold it. You don't have to hold it up, I'll hold it up. Well, the thing is, is that uh, the man has a way with words because of the fact that uh, when he said, I was standing before a lot of Elijah Muhammad's followers, when he made that speech in the late 1980s, he was standing before his own people. And in fact, when this photo was taken, he was standing in his own masjid. So, but the way in which he expressed himself in the late 1980s was to give the impression that he was standing before Farrakhan's followers. Because he had said after that, I didn't know if they were going to hit me with a karate blow or something of this nature. Uh, no, not that one. This one, I think, is, uh, is quite uh, impressive because Yanni, uh, this is, is actually this is quite sad. Uh, this right here is a um, uh, the front cover, of course, of, of course, of the final call of uh, announcing the uh, the death in '91 of the editor, the editor in chief of the final call. The interesting thing about the the uh, leader of the final call was the fact that I'm uh, sorry, not the leader of the final call, but rather the editor of the final call was that um, he was actually supplying free copies of the final call to uh, the British neo Nazis. And this was documented in a, um, in a, by a group called Searchlight, which uh, basically monitors racist groups that operate throughout Europe. And they documented letters that were sent by this same individual here, Abdul Wali Muhammad, he called himself, uh, as he was uh, corresponding with the leader of the European neo-Nazis, and he sent them free copies of the final call. Now, first of all, I want to say, well, why is he sending him you know, free copies? Well, the reason why is because of the fact that they have something in common, and that is racial separation. Now, it's quite normal, say, for example, for the, for, uh, the final call, let's say, to announce the, uh, the death of their editor-in-chief. But one, what, what one does not expect is for um, the same type of uh, announcement to be made in a uh, in Muslim journal. Because uh, this is where it becomes really sad. You see, because one would assume, Yanni, that uh, there shouldn't be any kind of connection, there shouldn't be any kind of condolences or any kind of um, honor that is given to a man who believes that Allah is a man. You see, and yet, here they are, you know, sending condolences to him. There's a lot more, but uh, I'm trying to be, as I said, I've sort of overextended myself, and inshallah I'll try to uh, close it at this point and open it up, inshallah, for questions and answers. Subhanallah wa bihamdi astaghfirullah wa alaykum wa Um, brother Idris, um, there was a brother that um, was introduced, uh, Waris Dean Muhammad introduced his brother to uh, that community uh, sometime in the 70s. And he introduced this individual as Mah uh, Muhammad Abdullah. And the, the cur it was, everyone was very curious at that time and wanted to know, was this man uh, the so-called W.D. Farrar? And he said that he wasn't. Then this man recently uh, passed away in Oakland, California, and in a book, uh, and also I think in a, a radio speech, he came out and said that this individual, in fact, was this uh, so-called mystic teacher, W.D. Farrar. Do you have any history or background on this individual, who he actually was, and uh, can you make anything a statement to that? Yeah, just uh, Yeah, this is true, that uh, this individual did uh, come forth and uh, uh, pass away recently. The thing is, is that um, uh, basically, in a nutshell, uh, the the man who called himself uh, W. Fard Muhammad or W. F. Muhammad, as well as a number of other names, and this person, Muhammad Abdullah, are two different people. Muhammad Abdullah, however, was indeed a Qadiani missionary who was sent from Pakistan originally to um, the South Pacific 
He came to the United States in the mid-1950s, taught there, left from California where he originally settled. In fact, he had a son, he had two sons, in fact, who studied in, um, uh, in the Oakland area. He left from there and he came to Philadelphia. And he was there, in fact, doing, uh, yani, teaching with WD, doing lessons or uh, transmitting lessons to WD. And then in later years, of course, he became um, one of, uh, appointed actually for a period of time, you know, to uh, WD's uh, Imam's Council. But uh, as I said before, him and, uh, and the other guy are two totally different people. And this, uh, this idea that, uh, that he and, and Fard were the same, one and the same person is, is not true. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was wondering if you could please explain a little bit about the 5% nation, which um, is probably an offshoot of the Nation of Islam, because they have a growing movement in Canada uh, right now, and I'm from Montreal, Canada, and uh, I'm, in, I'm in college, and you see, we, we have dawah programs and so on and so forth, but, and, and the thing is that they're counteracting everything we do, uh, because we, obviously many members of our, my MSA are of the African American uh, origin, and, um, not that they're being taken away, but they do a lot of dawah to African Americans, and they're counteracting everything we're doing because they also do read Quran. They also do read Quran and put the microphone down so the people can hear you. They read Quran and Hadith, and then they just use that again and saying that we don't have knowledge. I was just wondering. I mean, we don't have like they just happen to have an edge against it, and I was just wondering if you could just explain a bit about the five percent nation. Five percenters. Five percent is basically um, originated by this man. Um, uh, Clarence X in uh, in uh, in the East Coast in uh, the late 1960s, and to make a long story short, uh, he was basically a um, he was a former member of the NOI, and he broke away from the NOI and formed a his own group, which of course in later years became known as the so-called Five Percent Nation, where they developed like their own specific uh, ideology, which was uh, based on some of the old original teachings of the NLI uh, that uh, Elijah used to teach, of course, from actually the 1930s and through the 1960s. So uh, today, of course, you find that a number of some of the members of some of the rap groups, you know, attach themselves to that group and uh, have even adapted that ideology in some of their lyrics and so on. And uh, this is uh, actually, the, you can say, part of the legacy of the teachings of Elijah that uh, it has spurred, uh, yani, uh, regretfully, you know, the type of deviant type of beliefs and groups, you know, that have sprung from that. And this is uh, actually one of the consequences, you can say, of innovation, that um, as opposed to, let's say, uh, a person who had, had he been, say, for example, a religious reformer, a religious reformer, of course, Yanni, is only going to basically spread good, whereas, let's say, a, a religious innovator you one needs only to look at the fruit of you know that labor in order to really see what the result is. Yeah. Inshallah, we have some questions from the sisters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question here. Uh, Okay. All right. Yeah, um, they're announcing, of course, at this time that, uh, you know, it's time for Salah. I, again, I apologize really to everybody, you know, for, number one, the late start, and number two, you know, the fact that I ran a little bit over, over my time. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, perhaps, you know, we can get a chance, you know, in order to answer some of these questions, inshallah. Perhaps after Salah, maybe. Yeah. 